Hi, everyone. Let me know if uh, you can't hear me. Five out of five. All right. I can't hear you yet. Let's see. I'll uh, I'll I'll yell when I can hear you. I hear like a low level uh, noise, hum, but not your voice. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining. We will give Wayne a few minutes to get back on. He had some uh, microphone problems um, and uh, probably get started about one minute after the hour. All right, adding Wayne back. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Hold on. Something's weird. Uh, hold on. Joseph's asking to get on. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Um, I 
Oh, you're, you're laughing. Okay, maybe you figured it out. Okay, absolutely. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We're gonna give uh, Wayne just a minute to uh, figure out his mic situation, but I'm uh, super excited to figure out what the, uh, the strawberry talk is all about. So I think it will be uh, worth the wait. Thanks for hanging there. If you're just joining, we're just waiting for Wayne to, to um, try a different browser. He's having audio problems. And uh, hopefully we get up and running soon. Wish I had some uh, hold music to play or something. Oh, OK. He is joining. Fingers crossed. Okay, hey. so that looks like there's some mic <laughs> response. Right. Uh, he looks frozen to me. Okay. Wayne, we heard you for a moment, but then you completely uh, locked up. Yeah, uh, in the chat, it looked like um, Thomas Phipps was also seeing the frozen. Um, honestly, Wayne, if you want to join it even without your video, if you've, um, I don't know, it's fine there. Okay. Well, jump back on, Wayne, and we'll, uh, we'll let the chat decide. Just make sure they can see you, okay? And I'll turn my video off. Thanks for your patience. Okay, Wayne is joining again. Let's try this out. All right, let's see. We have audio, video, no freezing. Okay, I plugged in a hard line, so <laughs> that should help. That looks great. For the sake of time, right. let's just we'll skip we'll skip your, your whole bio, and uh, I'll hand it over to you because we're excited to figure out what shrubbery and landscaping taught you. Yeah. All right. Sounds great. So let me. Share screen here. And... All right. So, uh, title of this talk, uh, Bring Us to Shrubbery, uh, Surprising Links Between Gardening and Software Development. Um, so, uh, start out with a little story time here. And uh, one, once upon a time, on a warm weekend uh, in June earlier this year. Um, we had this plant here in the th that was growing out of our flower bed and we wanted to plant something different. Um, and so those, you know, finally 
decent enough weather. So uh, decided to go ahead and uh, start taking the thing out. Now, of course, I could just cut it off. But if you just cut it off, then you have roots to deal with and it'll grow back. So you know, really need to, to dig down and get all the roots out. Well, um, as I started to dig and kept on digging and kept on and kept on, uh, you know, the timestamp on my <laughs> photograph tells me that this actually was an hour later. Uh, so as you can see, it's still there. Uh, you can also see in the kind of the right hand side of that photograph that uh, there's this long root that's probably about three feet long there uh, that we had dug out and was part of this plant. Um, Turned out to be much more difficult than I had planned. We had this uh, 40 pound digging bar, I had to move some bricks and, you know, trying to break rocks. And it was just uh, really, really mm, surprising how much worse it was than uh, my initial plans were. Well, that wasn't the only plant uh, <laughs> that we had that needed to go. This other bush, um, also needed to be removed. Um, and there were a few more. So let, let's count what I had. So we had this one, uh, two, five, oh wait, uh, three. <laughs> um, and this is a simplified drawing of what it ended out um, looking like. We had uh, roots that were wrapped around roots. They were wrapped around rocks. They were twisted around roots that were twisted around other roots. Uh, eventually, our whole family was out there digging and excavating and trying to get all the, the, the roots of these plants out. Um, it took us pretty much all day to, to get rid of these uh, three <laughs> shrubbery. Um, and as I was as I was digging, I I started to to realize that there was a bit of a, a parallel with software development here. Um, you know, after we had dug through this, you know, this is what it looks like. Uh, I took this picture just two days ago, um, but we didn't actually get all the roots out. Uh, there's still this little plant that has started to grow back. So it looks like I'm going to have to go back and, and dig some more. Um, so what, what does all of that have to do with software development? Well, the thing that I realized is that, you know, software can be designed or it can grow organically. Um, Usually when it's growing organically, it's because there's an immediate problem um, that needs to be solved. And so somebody fixes their problem uh, and then somebody else comes along and they have an immediate problem and they fix that problem and so on and so forth uh, until you are left with this uh, system on the right here, uh, you know, a tangled mess full of horrifying blobs and confusing logic and you just can't really figure out what part goes where and uh you know you change one line of code and everything falls apart on you <laughs> um and it, you know if you've ever dealt with a, a system like that you know how incredibly painful it is um, but on the other hand if you are uh fortunate enough to have worked with a, a software system that's really designed well um, it's typically easy to follow the the logic path it's easy to figure out which pieces are responsible for uh, which bit of functionality um, and so you know the there's there's this um, uh, dichotomy between the two um, approaches to, to software development. Um, and so uh, there's a bit of an interlude here. Um, a while ago, um, a couple of years back, uh, we were releasing uh, several different versions of uh, Salt at a Time. I think we had three main versions that we were um, 
it's maintaining along with all of the uh, point release branches as well. So it ended up being something like uh, six to 12 branches that we were trying to maintain along with the test infrastructure at even any given time. Well, this, <laughs> this was something that grew and wasn't exactly designed. And so we decided to uh, take a step back and, um, and shift, right? Uh, we wanted to change the way that we were maintaining um, salt because doing that was just impossible. All of our time was spent uh, doing merges backwards and forwards and, and trying to keep things in sync, uh, trying to fix the tests. And uh, we just weren't shipping. Um, I think the, the worst uh, date slip that we had was over a year that it took us to actually get a release um, out the door. Uh, so we decided let's rewind and take um, a more careful approach. Let's actually design what it is that we want to do. And so we uh, we changed to a single branch of development, um, and that that's the release schedule that we follow today, where we have our main release, and then we may have a point release uh, on top of that uh, if we have some uh, bugs that need to be fixed. Now, this did cause an issue because you know we had these branches of development that had kind of exploded and we had been merging fixes and code back and forth but when we got our our one branch stabilized we tried uh tried to port things we tried to merge things and it just it didn't work at all um so what we realized is we need to go ahead and and change the way that we're <laughs> going about doing this and uh, and take more of a long um, game approach there. Uh, so we decided what we're going to do is all of these PRs that have been merged into these other branches that weren't in our, our main um, master branch, uh, we're going to eventually have to port all of those in. But we had also changed our requirement because our because the test suite was, again, so unwieldy, we just kind of were... Um, we were lax about requiring tests. And so we changed our, our approach there to, to be strict. Uh, nowadays, a PR requires tests, um, uh, tests and documentation um, to, in order to be merged. And so um, we said, okay, well, we'd love for help writing tests, but uh, you know, we'll go through and we'll write these tests and get these things merged in uh, as we have time. Um, and so we've we've been working on porting them um, and writing tests for the ones that don't have tests. We ended out, uh, I think we merged in a few hundred, but there are still several that, uh, several hundred that don't actually have tests. Um, so uh, to look at some of these, I wanted to use these as case studies for this idea of uh, this organic growth versus things being designed. Um, so this is PR uh, 50778. Um, and that was here originally to, um, to make a fix to the net API, um, specifically the tornado front end for that. Um, and on the face of it, it's a relatively simple fix, right? You can look here, it's five lines <laughs> that were changed. Um, we added this uh, sleep generator. And then we uh, we check this kind of throughout the, the code base. Um, and, you know, it was the correct uh, fix, I'm pretty sure, is what it ended out uh, doing. Um, if you caught in the, the keynote, um, uh, for when Gary gave his little acceptance speech there, he, he talked about the, the test clinic. Um, and I run the test clinic on Tuesdays and Thursdays on Twitch, um, where if you are 
writing a PR for salt and you need some help writing tests because writing tests is hard. Um, you know, that's, that's what we do there. Um, also tomorrow I have another talk where I'm going to go through um, getting started writing tests. So if you're interested in that, uh, be a good place to, to come hang out tomorrow. Um, but when it comes to this, uh, this particular one, um, it has no tests. <laughs> this is the extent of the PR. Uh, you know, it solved an immediate need. Um, and, but because it lacked tests, that means we can't go ahead and merge that in. Um, so we need to write tests for it. Um, but as I got into this code, it became evident that the code was, um, it was not designed <laughs> uh, specifically for testing, but it was grown. Um, it took several weeks. And by the time I finished with everything, uh, this is what that PR turned into. Um, most of this was just moving a huge block of code there, that big chunk in red, moving it up to the chunk in green, um, and just kind of splitting some things out to make them more testable. Uh, but you can see I did change a few things down in the body of uh, uh, of that other function. Um, you know, I learned a lot <laughs> in the process. I had never used Tornado before. Uh, I was aware of Tornado. I knew it had quote coroutines, um, but I didn't know anything beyond that. And uh, so it was a lot of learning experience, especially just figuring out how the heck to spin up an automated test framework with Tornado. Um, but ultimately, I was able to, um, I think, largely improve this code base, you know, change it and actually make some designs. Uh, I did have to dig. <laughs> I, was, I was digging and digging and digging. Um, I think it took uh, about a month of uh, four hours per week um, to, to finally get this to a place where um, where it could actually be merged. And it doesn't even, this little screenshot here, there wasn't even enough room to, to put the test cases that I wrote uh, down there. So there was quite a bit of code that ended up being added to the project. Um, but now I think it's much more maintainable. Um, it's well tested. I have um, as much confidence as I could possibly have in this code. Um, that at least that original fix <laughs> um, is working correctly and, and things are going the way that they, they should. Um, so here is an, here's another case study. So 51652. And this one looks like a simple change, right? Um, it's not even changing a full line. It's just changing a little bit of text on the line. Um, so it's a simple change, right? Uh, or, or is it? Um, so when we look at this code, we have to think, well, what do I need to know here? Well, the first name we need, the first thing we need to know is proname, even a column that exists. There are no tests for this PR. So we're not even running against an actual Postgres database. So I don't even know for sure that that, it, like, that that would even run. I've got no confidence in that. Um, so we, <laughs> we dig down a little bit and we start to see, oh, look, there's some, some more roots down there. Um, if proname exists, is it more correct than role name? Like, which, is, is it doing the right thing here? Um, so we've got to figure that out. There's there's another route that goes off over that direction. Um, you know, what's a function in Postgres? Uh, I know because I've used Postgres enough, but somebody who's not familiar with Postgres or databases may not understand what a function is in the database. They may not really have their, you know, we can assume you know what a function is because you're programming in Python, but is it the exact same thing? What are the differences? Do we know? Um, you know, if 
are there any other changes around here, right? Um, and if, because if this is a bug, are there other bugs that just weren't caught by whoever had this immediate problem? Um, and when I dug into it a little bit, I started to realize, wait a minute, proname actually just gets the name of the function, but this function here is actually trying to get the object owner. And so as I started to dig and dig, I, I started to see, <laughs> uh, you know, there are roots everywhere within this um, within this module, and in particular this function. You know, the roots have just gone all over the place, and they're twisted and tangled. And what is solving an immediate problem may not actually be the correct design for the software. Um, so there's lots of digging that needs to happen. You know, we need to cut a bunch of roots here, <laughs> a bunch of roots there. We've got to untangle it. We've got to make sure we're not cutting the roots of the tree that we want to keep. Um, you know, it ends out that there's quite a bit more than than appears on the surface. Um, so here's a another one, um, 50907. Um, you know, what's, what's in the size? Um, this is changing a grain and it's returning mem total times 1024 by 1024. Um, so is this the correct fix? It kind of looks like it's probably uh, correct, uh, at least for this one platform, but is it right for every platform? Um, you know, those are little roots and tendrils that you got to follow uh, follow along when you're writing these tests. Because I could write a test easily that would say, oh, whatever grains mem total is, that's what you need to return. Um, but that's a pretty significant difference um, in something that is going to be used basically everywhere. Um, so there's a lot of... Uh, <laughs> things that can look simple may end out being much more um, complicated. Um, this one, <laughs> it's barely a shrubbery at all. Uh, six, five, zero, six, one, three. Um, this one actually looks pretty simple and, and pretty straightforward and um, really isn't that big of a deal. Um, all it's doing is flushing the the file when there's changes or flushing uh, the file when there's a value. Um, and so it, it ends out like this one, following these roots, they don't actually go very far. And you can just kind of, oh, cool. I can just dig this out and, and, and go. Um, so this one, in order to be merged, it just needs some test cases and, uh, you know, PRs are welcome. Um, this would be a great first issue if you wanted to uh, to, to get your feet wet. Um, so how should we design or should we even design? Um, you know, is organic software better than design software? Um, and, uh, you know, I think like any good software developer, the more experience you get, the more often it depends is the correct answer. Um, and what I've seen is that if we are unfamiliar with the problem domain, um, then our solution tends to be much more organic, right? Uh, if we don't know, you know, if you have a problem domain and it's a certain size, you and your experience doesn't go beyond those those bounds. Um, you tend not to be able to um, design things as well because you don't have that full picture. Um, you you need to get kind of even a step back, a step further, to be able to uh, to truly design software. Uh, sometimes you know you don't have the time to to actually design. Um, maybe somebody needs something right now. 
and that's fine. Um, you know, uh, it it depends, right? So if the choice is between having a good design and losing out on some business opportunities or other opportunities or having a organic design and being able to at least capture some of those uh, opportunities, well, sometimes you have to make that choice. You have to make that decision uh, with some of the stakeholder, other stakeholders um, in, uh, in your domain. Um, and then sometimes you have to say, okay, well, we're going to do this horrible, atrocious thing right now, and then we're going to come back and fix it, right? Um, to go back to our interlude, uh, I don't think that anybody wanted to say, oh, we're going to have to just push these fixes that people have, um, have produced and we've merged. We're just going to have to push those things aside. Uh, and they're just going to have to get in over time. We all wanted to just grab it and put it in salt immediately. But sometimes you have to make that choice and say, we're going to make this because uh, this decision because we want salt to be stable. And just merging everything in won't produce stable software. Um, and for us, stability is, is more important and a more urgent need than... Uh, having those, those fixes in that may <laughs> or may not cause some more problems. Um, so that's really what I learned about um, designing software from gardening. Um, those the, the, the links between shrubs and software development. Uh, and uh, yeah, sometimes we have little tiny plants. Sometimes we have large things with a lot of horrible roots that you've got to <laughs> dig into. And uh, yeah, sometimes uh, sometimes you get the, the luxury of being able to do things uh, well the first time. Uh, <laughs> Thomas asks in chat, uh, can we get a plug for Test Clinic? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, I, I did earlier. I don't know if you came in late, but uh, yes, uh, uh, Tuesday afternoons and Thursday morning, uh, central time, uh, I run the test clinics. Um, always, always welcome. Um, you know, if you've, even if you're not really um, planning on testing something immediately, it's probably a good thing to come check out at least. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, links to the test clinic. Let me dump this here in chat and I can also stop sharing the screen. Um, Twitch.tv salt project OSS. Um, and also, if you go to uh, saltproject.io, That is also a um, uh, an excellent resource for all things salty. Um, you can find links to Twitch and IRC Discord, not Discord, um, Slack, um, kind of the whole nine yards there. So, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> other in things in chat. Uh, Jim Howard says there's never enough time to do it right, but there's always enough time to do it over. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> David says, I disagree. You almost never have time to do it over, <laughs> which, yep, yep. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Tom <laughs> asks, do I need to make a discord now? I don't know. I think, uh, I think we've actually had some people ask about that. There might be some unofficial Discord for Salt. There's also a uh, user's mailing list. Uh, we have an RSS feed, especially for the um, uh, security announcements, if you're interested in that, which you should be. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions? 
Yes, yes. Salt on the IRC as well. Uh, specifically on Libera.chat, we moved from Freenode. If, <laughs> if you have been around the IRC world, you know the kerfuffle that happened earlier this year about Freenode. <laughs> uh, yeah, good times. <laughs> Some people make some choices, uh, but Liberia is is where we live today. So, uh, th and it is actually bridged to the IRC channel on uh, Slack, and I believe that um, possibly Imran, one of the community members who um, works with the um, uh, formulas a lot, uh, the I think he's the captain of the formulas working group. Um, I believe he maintains a matrix bridge as well for um, uh, salt. So if you're interested in that, uh, I know uh, I know he can point the way to that, but it's not uh, officially maintained that I that I'm aware of. Um, yeah. So we've got a little bit more time for the next session, but you know, um, Wayne, you're so used to streaming and Twitch, so I, f I figure maybe some questions will kind of just trickle in, and if folks want to want to stay on, that's great. Yep. And well, yeah, let, let us know when you when you want to break. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so I. Uh, if you're familiar with, or if you've been to the open hour at all, my, uh, oh yeah, uh, salt extensions and uh, custom modules, I was actually gonna bring that up. Um, uh, so, uh, but the, on, I was gonna say on open hour, one of the, my, my go-tos there at the end is to, sign off with a, a horrible, horrible joke. So <laughs> I'll uh, share one of those now. So uh, how does a penguin build its house? It glues it together. <laughs> Science, right? Yep. Waka, waka, waka. <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Um, so some other questions there. Uh, Thomas mentions uh, about testing for salt extensions and custom modules. Um, yes, the uh, salt extensions, if you are unaware of those, um, that is kind of our, um, uh, not necessarily experimental, but um, the our, our our new way forward, um, as it were, uh, the the goal behind salt extensions is to offer pip installable um, solutions um, for basically extensions to salt. Um, one of the things you know we talk about this uh, all the support right and that whole test framework and how it just took forever. Uh, you know, if you've submitted a PR to SALT, you may be aware that, it, you know, our, our test suite is not fast. Um, if we run the complete test suite, I think it takes about six hours to run. Um, but when you look at the list of modules that we have in SALT, um, this being a list of the uh, modules directory, um, I get 528 modules. Um, so, and that's just the modules that doesn't include states or necessarily utils. Um, so the, the test suite takes a long time. And like Thomas says, it doesn't, it doesn't even test. It's not a hundred percent test coverage. I think we're roughly 40%, a little over 40% test coverage now. Um, so it's, you know, there's this huge 
um, blocker, I guess, or amount of friction when it comes to um, to, to making fixes in in salt. And so, uh, rather than try to hold everybody and everything back, we realize you know most of these modules are either a sort of standalone um, or B, maybe just not really that um, that central. So SALT currently has this batteries included approach where just everything lives in the SALT repo. And so we've realized we probably want to start breaking that out. And the extension modules um, have been a way for us to, uh, to change that a lot. Um, so we have a few extension modules already under development. Um, one of the big ones, of course, is the, the SALT extension modules for VMware. Um, and it's so much nicer to have a test suite that we can run um, on all our PRs in a few minutes. <laughs> um, and on so on the, the extension module that uh, I've been working with, which is the one for VMware, um, we have unit tests and functional or integration tests where which are actually you know spinning up and running against a live vSphere and vCenter, um, which uh, those take a relatively significant amount of time. Um, but we just run the unit tests on PR, and you know it's been a much much nicer experience to be able to to have that confidence and to do it quickly rather than. Um, a long time, and uh, our release process is also much much simpler um, because we don't have to test across every single operating system and, and platform under the sun like we do with uh, the core of Salt. Um, so the extension modules are are very good. Um, we have a there's a project out there. I think it's called Salt Extension, um, and uh, that is super handy um, because it'll it'll let you just start up a, a project template. So if you're not familiar with kind of some of the um, vagaries of creating a module, um, that's a really good way to go because it'll get you a, a lot of what you need right out of the box, um, <clears throat> including documentation. We're working on building a plugin registry, so um, you can say, oh, I want to manage Nginx, or I want to manage Apache, or I want uh, whatever it is that you need. And then you can just get a list of the modules that may support that, uh, along with their like maturity level um, <clears throat> and all kinds of other uh, fancy, handy um, things. So that's, that's what we're working on uh, today. There have been a few folks who have done that out in the wild, but it's, yeah, very nice. Um, so uh, I, I apologize if I butcher your name, but uh, Eliezer says, is the current Salt Core test suite somehow usable for checking user states also? Um, it could be a lot of the functionality that we have you could use. Um, but if you create an extension module, that would actually be much better because it, it uses salt under the hood to test and Oops. Uh... Yeah, it looks like Wayne maybe is frozen for a second bits and pieces. Oh, <laughs> I guess I got a little blurp. Uh, what was the last thing I <laughs> you heard from me? Uh, still frozen. <laughs> no, 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 it's better now. Maybe lost about 15 seconds. Oh, nice. Uh, did you hear me responding about the SALT test suite somehow being usable for checking user states? Yeah, so you're, you're <laughs> midway through that. OK, um, yeah, so my recommendation there is to just use an extension module, like create your own salt extension, because what that allows you to do is, um, I mean, one, you can pip install it. So you don't 
have to necessarily put it upload it to PyPI, though if you can open source it, then great. Then you can get some more um, you know, community involvement there. But if you um if you just um all you really need to be able to pip install something is have a place where it can live. So you could store that on your salt master and you could have a state that pushes that file out to your minions and do a pip install from the directory. Um, and it would be able to, to find your package. You can version it, you know, use Semver or Calver or whatever crazy alternative versions you want. Um, and you can actually be able to get that onto all your minions that way. Um, so it's, yeah, it's super handy. Um, and yeah, Damon says it'd be good if you can pip install on the master and the location of extensions is pushed out to all the minions. Uh, minions most of the time do not have access to pip over the internet. Uh, yeah, so as uh, um, there are a few different uh, packages out there where you can run your own PyPI. But again, if you aren't interested in doing that, um, and we should, uh, we should write some more documentation on this, I think, uh, obviously. <laughs> um, but one thing that you can do, could totally do is, is like I mentioned, um, you know, if you bundle your, um, uh, your package, you can use pip, uh, it's pip wheel, um, I believe that this is a command. I'm going to drop it here in chat. Um, And what that would do in your extension module is it builds the wheel that your it builds your extension module into a wheel, and then it also downloads all the other wheels that your um, module depends on, and dumps those into that disk directory. So you could easily um, set something up to bundle all the wheel together, uh, shove that in your salt master file server and then uh, serve all those necessary files to your minions um, and when they're in a directory you can do a pip install uh, find links I think it is uh, path to files uh, your HD mod. Uh, so if you did something like that then you would be able to um, you basically would copy all of the files to that path to files directory on your minions, and then you could uh, pip install from there. Um, that is actually a really good um, comment with the uh, doing the, the pip install. There might be some ways, it doesn't exist right now anyways, uh, but there might be some ways that we would be able to make that more um, uh, automatic or built into salt, uh, especially given kind of the nature of the extension modules to be able to just provide those in the salt master and then allow your um, your minions to use the master as the, the pip upstream. Uh, or the PyPI. Um, but yeah, that's the um, DWAS just mentioned you can put your package on Salt's file server and then pip install it using a state. That's, uh, that's probably the easiest way to do it currently. <laughs> um, Oh, yeah. Uh, so Damon Atkins mentions there's RSpec for salt. Cannot remember the name built into salt. Um, and if I'm pronouncing it correctly, I think, Victor, uh, do you mean test in for regarding RSpec for salt? Yeah, there is a uh, DWAS you might be able to um, uh, know it off the top of your head or Thomas, but the... Um, for testing your salt states, there's a, I don't ever use it, but I know some people who have large um, states, I think it's like salt test or something. 
that allows you to salt check. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of. Um, and so it allows you to to do some testing. I've never used it, so I'm definitely the wrong person for <laughs> answering any questions about that. But I know the um, there are a lot of people in the community Slack who have used it and talk about salt check uh, with some frequency. At least it comes up somewhat often in there. Um, so um, yeah, that, that would definitely be an option for that. <laughs> Thomas says, I've used it once, it works. <laughs> what more do you need? <laughs> uh, I think we are. Uh... Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, so looks like Christian McHugh has um, posted something on LinkedIn about uh, salt check. Um, <laughs> what started working in 3001 nice <laughs> um yeah um i think we're kind of bumping up into the end of time here um any other questions uh extensions versus item um i know a large focus for item is around uh like the cloud infrastructure and um, kind of automating a lot of that. Um, but yeah, that's a, <laughs> why not both? Um, you know, I'd say pick both of them up and try them out, you know, kick the tires and see which one works best for you and uh, your situation. Cause that's really what it boils down to is that, um, you know, if you have a lot of things in salt, especially um, already, then an extension module will be will probably be better integrated um, into all of that functionality and those models. Um, item does have does still can still take advantage of a lot of that, uh, but it's just a slightly different pattern. So it may be, um, you know, it might be a little bit off on one side. So it just really depends on what it is that you're, uh... <laughs> it depends, right? <laughs> um, what is the future? Uh, should people write an item and pip install it into salt? Is salt moving over to item? That is a very common and popular question. Item is not a replacement for salt. Um, it is a companion project. Uh, I believe that item is one of the most recent releases. We had actually made item um, or built some item hooks into Salt. So Salt can use um, item in states and modules, uh, but it's not, it's not a replacement. Um, it is just a companion project and a uh, alternate tool um, in the Salt ecosystem. So. Uh, yeah, there, you may often find people saying, oh, this is next next gen salt. And I mean, not quite. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very superficial understanding, I'd say. Um, but yeah. Awesome. I think we're just about at time. So um, Wayne, thanks for, uh, for sharing your knowledge today. And thanks for everyone for participating and hanging out with us for a little bit. And um, just a quick plug for um, if you're interested in item, Tyler is giving a talk coming up next in uh, about 10 minutes. So yeah, I want to catch that. That would be a perfect thing for that. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. Hey. Bye.